first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, everyone uh, for inviting me and uh, Mohammed in particular. Um, I want to tell you that of all the things that um, Mohammed was very kindly said in his introduction, the most important for me is, is mentoring. And uh, mentoring and the new next generation uh, is a very important part of what uh, I'm particularly proud of. And I must tell you that uh, I have mentored fellows for 30 years now, from the beginning. So the um, I, I uh, so therefore I think what's important to me is like the mentoring. And I must tell you, in the 30 years, I've mentored many many uh, people. But um, I can I and as and my mentees are like my children. I, I'm very proud of everyone, uh, but there's always a favorite son or daughter, and, um, and, and, and people know who your favorite son is. And in fact, in, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, everyone um, would always say, is this work as good as Mohammed? And, I, and, uh, and, and they would always say, and because I would tell them about all the great work and all the things we did together, and they would always compare themselves to him, to Dr. Badawi, and and uh, and I would I would say, well, you're getting close, but you know, keep working. Let's move on to the next project so that we can attain that. So, um, Mohammed and I have 20 years, and like I said, everyone has a favorite son, and I think to everyone uh, who knows me, they know who that is. So I'm going to. Um, talk about uh, evidence-based approach to the infertile patient with advanced endometriosis. Now, endometriosis, we give courses on it. And when uh, Mohammed asked me, he said, you know, give something in detail. I decided that I would choose one topic because really uh, it would be um, uh, very difficult to squeeze it all in. And uh, so I'm going to look at it, the infertile patient with advanced endometriosis. By the way, this is this lecture. I'm is uh, I'm going to be. It's part of this course called Controversies in Endo, Adeno, and Fibroids, which is going to be given in three days. And so, now, let us say here. Let us see the objectives of this. And I think that what is important is that um, we're going to discuss the impact of fertility outcome in patients with deeply infiltrating disease or endometrioma, the complications of surgery and discuss the consequences of non-operative approach, which means assisted reproductive technology. So the first thing, um, and can I ask, do you see the uh, arrow? Can someone tell me if you see the arrow as I'm moving it around or not? Yes. Okay, you're good. Right, so this is a summary of the um, pathophysiology of endometriosis. It's very complex and uh, there are different uh, 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 theories, and uh, you know, ultimately, there's an uh, altered immune population. There's uh, endometrial tissue through blood vessels. There are candidate uh, epithelial stem cells. So when we have regurgitation of the endometrium for implantation, it's not that that tissue sticks, it could, but most likely there are stem cells within that uh, tissue, which leads to implantation. On the ovary, there may be another um, uh, type of um, explanation. It could be the metaplasia on the surface with invagination. It could be that the, this endometrial tissue colonizes the corpus luteum. Um, a very popular one is the so-called Mullerianosis hypothesis that has to do with the uh, spread of this uh, uh, um, endometroid tissue, endometrial tissue, you know, as during development. But for deeply infiltrating disease, we're going to look at it. It's a most inf uh, deeply infiltrating disease is a retroperitoneal disease, as you see in the lower uh, screen. Now, traditionally, the abnormal endometrium is what leads to this implant. But we know, and we'll go into a little bit more detail in clinical outcomes, that even the deeply infiltrating endometriosis, the advanced endometriosis, can have an effect on the endometrium with crosstalk. And therefore, what is important is this can affect the endometrium, potentially implantation, 
And therefore, we must think of how we can suppress this, even if we decide on, uh, on, on different types of treatment and to have an effect on implantation. So the important concept here is that I want to give is the crosstalk between the implant and the endometrium. And I also want to have the consideration that we are dealing with different phenotypes of which one phenotype is the ovarian disease. One phenotype is the deeply infiltrating disease. One other phenotype is the peritoneal disease. And all these um, types, phenotypes has a etiology, which is a little bit different and a lot of overlap. So let me tell you, endometriosis is a very controversial uh, uh, disease in the literature and everyone has um, their personal um, opinion. And in fact, the, um, uh, I've given uh, uh, you know, these debates, they, they put me in the surgical corner, uh, although I do IVF as well. And uh, so the, la and the, you know, the many debates, here are the surgeons, here's the IVF doctors. But in fact, you know, we look at it um, holistically. So, but for surgery, there's a, um, there's a famous group, you know, of which Victor Gommel is probably the most famous there. And he's at the University of British Columbia. I know him very well. In fact, uh, Victor Gomel was chairman when I was a resident. So he's been around for a long time. And he's as brilliant now as he was, you know, forever. And the point of, the, of this is that this group said, evid the evidence this is a, 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 an opinion piece in the journal that I am editor, evidence-based medicine surgery in endometrial surgery, double-blind randomized trial versus consensus opinion of experts. What they were saying is for surgical trials, it's very difficult to do double-blind randomized trials. So therefore we must rely on consensus of opinion. And so they were, they were talking about this randomized trial that was published in JMEG specifically when it has to do with peritoneal disease, ablation or excision. But the same group, uh, sent a letter to the editor, 2013, the same port, and they said, uh, uh, this is after a consensus on the current management of endometriosis was published in human reproduction. And the letter to the editor said the title is misleading. An opinion paper is not a consensus. So they were debating, not that you have uh, uh, a trial, but you know what is a consensus paper? And the consensus... I'm sorry, the response was, it must be stated at the outset, there is no consensus in the literature as to what constitutes a consensus paper. So from my perspective, a consensus is if you agree with me, then we'll have a consensus. And if we disagree, then we have personal opinion. But the point of this is that there's going to be a lot of opinion rather than uh, consensus. As usual, I think it's very important for us to start with a case, and then we can discuss how we're going to approach this patient. So let us say we have a 36-year-old woman with a two-year history of infertility and no pregnancy, uh, prior pregnancy. And she consults you for management. Investigation is normal, including semen analysis and assessment of tubal, uh, and assess, uh, tubal assessment. The ultrasound demonstrate a unilateral three centimeter endometrioma and potential deeply infiltrating endometriosis. So she comes to see you, she's infertile, no, uh, no, no prior pregnancy, all investigation is normal, except the ultrasound shows a three centimeter um, endometrioma and potential deeply infiltrating endometriosis. So what are we going to consider with this patient? Well, we would like to know what the pregnancy outcome would be if I operated versus IVF. I want to know if my surgery will in fact impact the subsequent IVF uh, if required. So if I operate and then the IVF gets better or, or, or the IVF get worse, or there's no change. We need to talk about the intraoperative and postoperative complications of these patients because the patient may say, you know, the, the complication rate is too high. And then we have to really ask, what are the priorities for the patient? What are the patient's concerns? And we can come up with a plan for the patient. 
So what is deeply infiltrating endometriosis? Generally, we, are, we say that the nodules extending more than five millimeters be, uh, beneath the peritoneum is uh, deeply infiltrating endometriosis. And it can involve the uterosacral ligaments, the vagina, the bowel, the bladder, the ureters. As you see over here, this patient has deeply infiltrating endometriosis of the rectal cervical area, and rectal cervical area. And that is typical of where deeply infiltrating endometriosis is. In fact, for this patient, the tubes and ovaries are completely normal. And if you looked at this patient, a laparoscopy, you would say, oh, there's an implant over here in the right pelvic sidewall. This, you know, will take 20 minutes to and cut a few adhesions. In fact, this patient will take two hours and 20 minutes because of this lesion over here. And the second question we have is how can this really deeply infiltrating disease have an impact on, on fertility? This is deeply infiltrating disease. The tubes and ovaries are normal. And therefore, as I stated before in the, in the introductory comments about the pathophysiology, it is possible that the disease itself may be having an effect on the endometrium. Now, as I said, these are different types of deeply infiltrating disease. We have the bladder on the panel on the far left, a blocked ureter on the one next to it, sigmoid endometriosis. And over here, we have rectal endometriosis with obliteration in the cul-de-sac. And again, we ask ourselves, how does this bladder endometriosis or a block ureter, sigmoid lesion, or in this one here, which is a rectal cervical endometriosis with obliteration in the cul-de-sac, have an effect on fertility when the tubes and ovaries are normal? And if we operate, will this improve the fertility? All right, so let's start with endometriomas. Endometriomas is part of the concept of deeply infiltrating disease or advanced endometriosis. And what we see here is a patient that, um, that is often what we see with bilateral endometriomas and the uterus. And we have to make a decision what we're going to do with this patient. Now, the first consideration with this patient is that if you are operating because of pain, there are those that believe it's not necessarily the endometrioma that's contributing to most of the pain. In fact, if you lift the ovary up, as you see over here, you will find deeply infiltrating disease that is going around the level of the ureter and the parametrum. And it is this disease that in fact causes most of the pain. So if you are operating on this patient with a three centimeter endometrioma and has severe pain as well as infertility, but let's say pain, and you just remove the endometrioma, the patient will probably continue to have pain. So it's very important if you're going to go in for purposes of pain, you should remove this disease. Now, for purposes of infertility, you may say, a uh, patient has no pain, you know, what, what do I do? And we have to then come up with a clear understanding of what you can or cannot do based on the patient's needs. If the patient has absolutely no pain at all, which is a possibility, but unlikely, um, then what are you doing there in laparoscopy in the first place? This is a three centimeter endometrioma, which we would not operate on even for purposes of IVF. If you're going in because you say the patient has severe pain and infertility, then you better treat this, although you would want to treat just the uh, ovarian disease, but you better treat this as well if you want to have an impact on pain. So the first question we have is, does the mere presence of an endometrioma have an impact on the ovarian reserve? Now remember, the ovarian reserve is a reflection of both function and quantity, quality and quantity. But oftentimes when we measure like anti hormone, we are in fact uh, measuring mostly quantity, although it has a relationship with quality. So if you look at anti hormone, and you look at this that was published a few years ago, they stratified the patient by age, and then they looked at bilateral endometriomas, unilateral endometriomas, and controls. And as you see, as it decreases with age, the anti hormone, however, at any particular age, the one with the bilateral endometriomas has the lowest anti hormone, a reflection 
of something is going on in the ovary before you even touch the patient. And we know for a fact that these cysts, which have the um, a fibrotic layer and usually fluid filled, and it has a, an epithelial lining, that these are extremely pro-inflammatory. And this pro-inflammatory environment may have an effect on the um, follicles. Also, the way that endometrioma develops is such a way that it is firmly adherent to the cortex. So rather than an, an, uh, a dermoid cyst, which can be easily removed, or cystadenoma, these are firmly adherent. And this fibrotic layer interface, again, a lot of inflammation. Now, we do know there's an intrinsic decrease. So therefore, we have to ask ourselves is that when we're doing the surgery and removing the cyst, are we also having an effect on ovarian reserve? As you see here, this is the cyst being removed. And when you pull, you see, you see there are, uh, this is a fibrotic layer, as I showed you before. On this side, you see the fibrosis, and this is attached firmly to the cortex. So if you pull, you may be pulling ovarian tissue with it. So what we find in patients with endometriomas, oftentimes they're adherent to the pelvic sidewall. And before we initiate surgery, we should always see, look for, to the other side to make sure the tube and ovary are normal. Because oftentimes we may start the surgery and find uh, that the other side is missing or someone's already operated on them. And then we have to be much more conservative in the ovary we were working on. If someone has had previous surgery, the ovary is diminished on the other side, then this side, you need to be very, very conservative or else you will truly diminish ovarian reserve. Now, ultimately, if we're going to proceed to surgery, we need to figure out how to minimize damage. And the way we minimize damage is by, uh, by understanding the um, uh, steps that go into removal of the, uh, of, of the cyst, which can cause more damage to the ovary by decreasing ovarian reserve. Now, just remember, if we remove the endometrioma, the randomized clinical trials have shown that in fact, we increase spontaneous pregnancy and decrease recurrence of disease and obviously remove pain. If you, do, if you just ablate the inside, then you will have not as high of the pregnancy rate, but higher recurrence. So removing the cyst will increase spontaneous pregnancy, not with IVF, which we'll talk about in a minute, but spontaneous pregnancy will be improved according to the Cochrane database, recurrence will be decreased if you remove the cyst. However, when you're removing the cyst, you may damage the ovary and therefore we must come up with the principles of minimizing damage. So spontaneous pregnancy improved, IVF pregnancy, as you'll see, will not be improved, but spontaneous pregnancy. And how do you decide whether you remove the cyst and take the risk of decreasing ovarian reserve or actually uh, use alternative methods and not remove it if she's going on to IVF. So ultimately the cyst will rupture. And if the cyst doesn't rupture, it usually winds up uh, being uh, rupturing it so that I can dissect it uh, myself. So the first concept that we have is where's the blood supply? Because as you pull on the cyst, as you see over here, you will get to the mesovarium, the hilus, and that's where the blood vessels are. So the medulla here has nervous tissue and the blood vessels. And the problem is if you pull there, if you pull at the top, when you start, you pull ovarian tissue. And if you pull at the mesovarium, you pull at the ovarian hilus. That's where the bleeding occurs. And the tendency is then to use electrosurgery, which can further impede the ovarian reserve. And contrary to what you see here where the cyst is being pulled off easily, in fact, most endometriomas, they don't pull out easily. You must use a combination of different techniques. So the first thing we encounter when we make the incision is fibrosis. And this fibrotic layer is firmly adherent to the 
um, cortex very quite firmly. And therefore this tissue, this fibrosis firmly there, you pull ovarian cortex will come with it. So what can we do to minimize damage? Well, when you see the adhesions, rather than pulling, you can cut them. And in fact, I use energy, plasma energy, which is a commercially available, um, so that I can, I, can, I can burn it or cut it very delicately rather than pulling. If it comes easily, that's fine. With large cysts, sorry, with large cysts, in fact, of eight centimeters or so, the glistening layer here of the fibrotic part of the cyst often gets confused with the cortex, which remember all the eggs are within a few millimeters of the surface. Now, one of the things we can do to minimize uh, damage is to in inject uh, dilute vasopressin. There are several randomized clinical trials that show that if you uh, inject dilute vasopressin, now vasopressin is not available in many countries. It is not, for example, available in uh, most, most parts of Europe or the United States and in, in Canada. I dilute it 20 units in 200, and then you can inject it under the cortex and this will decrease small bleeders. Now, the trend that we have is rather than using electrosurgery is to use a hemostatic agent. This is one called flow seal, and this is used in the United States. Uh, I use it as a hemostatic agent. There's another one in the United States called Arista, which does not have um, any, any uh, uh, human byproducts for certain patients that do not want to use it. So at the end of the, of the case, rather than using too much electrosurgery, we, we put in this hemostatic agent, then continue on with the work. And at the end, we look again to, in order to diminish the use of electrosurgery, which has a penetration sufficient to either, to either um, destroy the cortex or uh, additionally compromise the blood supply. Now there are th others that have used diff different techniques, for example, they go in, drain the cyst, put the patient on a GnRH agonist and go in and vaporize. Um, this is associated with a higher recurrence rate. So the tendency is not to use it, but it's not nothing wrong with it. It's just that it has a higher recurrence rate. Now Donay, Jacques Donay um, feels that what you should do is you do the cystectomy of most of the, of the cyst but in the higher region where it bleeds, rather than pulling it and causing bleeding, you can just vaporize it. Um, and that is another possibility, but even that is associated with a higher recurrence rate. Now for small endometriomas over here, this is uh, the plasma energy, which is a very, very superficial depth of penetration. Um, and this is, a, uh, a but it has a higher recurrence rate, but nonetheless, if you are doing this for a patient that's moving on to IVF, you may consider it. I use it for very small surface endometriomas rather than cutting into the cortex. So that's another possibility. Now the electrosurgical approach, the capsule may be, this, this capsule here may be uh, three millimeters, but bipolar electrosurgery uh, could penetrate up to 10 or 12 millimeters, although you can use microbipolar and you can put the energy much lower. But this deep coagulation may uh, destroy the follicles. Remember, um, this fibrotic layer, which has the endometrial surface, is firmly attached to the ovarian cortex. Now, other techniques to minimize damage is uh, using suturing. So this is a study where the impact of ovarian reserve of bipolar coagulation versus suture following surgical stripping of ovarian endometrioma. This was tw uh, 21 studies, 320, uh, 12 patients. Bipolar coagulation did more harm. Another systematic review, five out of six studies decreased ovarian reserve after bipolar electrosurgery. And in all three randomized clinical trials, desiccation groups had greater loss. Uh, and therefore suturing is definitely a possibility, or like I said, using hemostatic agent. Now, suturing has really been simplified dramatically nowadays because of the barb suture, where again, you don't have to tie knots and you put it into the, uh, into the tissue and just pull, and this will decrease the bleeding. 
Now, even in spite of that, if we look at uh, my own uh, uh, data, I, we had uh, patients with endometriomas and then two control groups, one with no endometriosis and one with pelvic peritoneal endometriosis. And we did the surgery and at one month there was a decrease in antimalarian hormone in the patients we operated on. And so the a concept over here is that we can decrease it even in the best of, of, uh, of, of, of techniques. And therefore it's very important to understand what level you have to do. Since the Cochrane database showed no improvement of IVF after cystectomy, then the consideration is that if it does not impede IVF, then and has, the patient has no pain and you're not worried, then you can you should you can proceed to IVF. There's no point in removing the endometrioma because it will not improve IVF outcome. So if you look at this meta-analysis and Cochrane database, ovarian cystectomy does not yield improved clinical uh, uh, pregnancy rates. No difference, significant difference. So as a general rule, as I stated, the endometrioma, spontaneous pregnancy rates, according to the Cochrane Review, are improved. However, removing the cyst does not improve IVF outcome. So if you are going in to improve fertility, and then you can remove the cyst. If you're not going in to improve fertility, you're going in uh, to improve pain, then you should consider what you're doing and focus maybe on other areas and be more conservative. So deeply infiltrating endometriosis now of the rectal uh, uh, cervical area, rectal vaginal. So first of all, this is an MRI sagittal view. The rectum is on where the arrow is being pointed. This is the cervix. And you can see the lesion is the, is the rectal cervical lesion infiltrating in the vagina. In fact, the septum, which you see over here, is quite clear. And this is typical of most endometriosis involving the rectum. So this is a better, uh, another view. And so what we have here, you see is this lesion, and you see the rectal fat and this lesion. Now, the good news is the rectal vaginal septum is spared, as it usually is. That means I can get underneath the lesion and, and, uh, and, and gently release it, and therefore then I can remove it in the back of the cervix. And I'll show you how we do it. So for deep endometriosis infiltrating the rectal sigmoid, uh, there are critical factors to consider <laughs> before the management. We published this in 2015, and we came up with our own algorithm of how to proceed. Now, there are three different ways of managing deeply infiltrating disease involving the rectum. The first way is to resect the bowel. So you do a bowel resection. So this is called a segmental resection. The other way is to do something called a shaving technique, which is just a superficial, not superficial, but a excision, but leaving uh, the muscularis, or most of the muscularis intact, or you can do a nodule resection. And basically, if it involves the inner muscularis layer, you need to segmentally resect because you will get into the lumen. If you have multiple nodules, you have to segmental resect. Uh, but if it involves just the outer layer of the muscularis, then you can do the saving technique or do a nodule resection. If you see at the top though, we say with patients with pain and patients without pain. And therefore we felt that the only time we would really operate with this is if the patient had a high pain score. Now, when a patient has deeply infiltrating disease, infertility, and no pain, then there's what's the point? You know, the, the purpose of this is to improve pain. Not to say that the in, in, uh, surgery will not improve fertility, because it will, but you may have alternatives like IVF. But surgery definitely improves fertility, but so does IVF. And if you're not doing it with pain, then for pain, then you are not necessarily having to take the, the risks that go with it. So shaving technique means that you have a nodule that is on the bowel. This is the outer muscularis layer. So this nodule was taken off the back over here of the vagina. This is the rectal cervical area. And you can start to see, in fact, that the area below the lesion is free of disease. So, so the concept is to dissect on both sides 
And then the lesion is taken off the back of the uterus, the back of the cervix, on the, which is on the vagina, of course, and then so that it can stay on the rectum. So this is um, basically how we start. We open the, the retroperitoneal space. We open the, uh, we dissect the ureter. We go into the pararectal space or the uh, Okobayashi space over here. And in this Okobayashi space, by the way, is the um, parasym the uh, autonomic nerves and system, <clears throat> which when we're doing nerve sparing surgery, this is kept intact. So these parasym the uh, not parasympathetic, but uh, autonomic nerves, which this in, in this area is called the inferior hypogastric plexus, and these nerves need to be spared. We use a sponge stick in the vagina. We use a rectal probe, and based on this, as you see, the lesion is removed off the back of the, the uh, cervical area, but we have a free area, and this lesion is then here. And as you see, the lesion stays over here, and therefore, you basically shave it off the rectum. Now, if it's a small lesion sometimes, and it, it, it goes deeper, then you can do a nodular resection, as you see over here. This is the proctoscope. And then you simply close the area and you see its closure. And then we have both ureters dissected and this patient will do as well. Or you can do a bowel resection, <laughs> which you can do by laparoscopy. You make a small mini lap. This is the tubing. You see this, this tubing over here is, is uh, five millimeters in diameter. We put in the anvil and we do the, uh, the, uh, the, the resection. As you hear, see the patient had multiple skip lesions, including the cecum. So the question then is surgery for deeply infiltrating endometriosis. How will this affect pregnancy? So in our patient, she's um, under 35. She has a, a deeply infiltrating disease. So now we have to say to ourselves, what, what's the pregnancy rate from this? Because we know we can improve uh, uh, pain what about fertility? So it, in this summary published in 2014, deeply infiltrating disease, but no bowel involvement. So all the other stuff I showed you, the ear, the bladder, the spontaneous pregnancy rate surgically treated is 50%. Now, now it's 50% over years. This is not like IVF where it's per cycle. But the point though is that if you have deeply infiltrating disease of the bladder, the ureter, and, and the cul-de-sac, not necessarily of the rectum, and you remove it and you allow, and the patient, you did it for pain, these patients can achieve pregnancy. Now, if you have deeply infiltrating disease, but you also have bowel involvement, but not surgically treated, you just leave it there, post-art is about 29%. But if you treat it surgically, we have a spontaneous pregnancy rate of 28%. But if you include with art, it's 45%. But what I wanted to show you is that if you leave the disease and do IVF, it's 29%. If you remove the disease, the spontaneous pregnancy rate is 28%. So what does that say? If you are doing the surgery for a patient for pain, you will have a pregnancy rate, which is quite good and comparable to those that don't have pain and you just do IVF. Now, there are many confounding variables such as the follow-up period and the unknown fertility status before surgery. And that's the problem with many of these things. Not all patients were infertile. So if we take a look at the study that was uh, published by Paolo Vercellini's group in seminars a few years ago, and they only took patients with spontaneous conception and infertile women at the end of the follow-up period after radical surgery for rectovaginal, rectosigma, and endometriosis. And you'll see that the pregnancy rate from all these studies is between 20 and 30%, so 28%. But again, the follow-up period is, um, uh, is it, it depends. You know, the follow-up period, you see over here, 24 months, 27 months, 44 months. So this is very important. But if you were doing the surgery for pain anyway, you can tell the patient there is a spontaneous pregnancy, which is could be similar to IVF, depending on many other factors, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
So the most important thing here is, is to predict with the patient who's going to get pregnant from your surgery or not if you're doing it for pain or for fertility or the patient doesn't want IVF. So the first thing is you see on the left, I have two patients. The upper one has an endometrioma and I say, and I look in and I can barely see the uterus. It's extensive adhesions, tube ovarian disease, extensive uh, adhesions, you know, uh, absent uh, fimbria or minimal fimbria. And if you look at this patient, she's gonna go on to IVF for sure. Because even after lysing all these adhesions, fixing the, end, the endometrioma, this patient, the function of the tubes is, is not um, adequate. They, they could be, but it's not likely. The fimbria are compromised. The ovary has a dysfunction because of the amount of tissue you removed. So this patient is best served with IVF. So this one here, then you should be very conservative with the endometrioma. Now, the one at the bottom here, as you see, the tube and ovary is completely normal. And this patient has severe rectal cervical disease and a lot of pain. Now, this patient, since the tubes and ovaries are normal, I removed this disease, she will be, pain, uh, her pain will improve dramatically and her fertility will improve dramatically because the tubes and ovaries. So you look inside the patient and you decide where to go. Now, ideally, you would want to do this before the surgery. Ideally, you want to do this before the surgery, but for the moment, we have something called, and you can look at it, an experienced person will say, the top panel is a mess, the bottom one I can help by surgery to improve fertility. Now, you can also quantify it, the prediction by something called the endometriosis fertility index. And this was uh, invented, uh, invented uh, reported by Adamson, but there are many, many publications on this to validate it. And in fact, there are many papers, come, more and more papers. So now at the end of the surgery, at the conclusion of the surgery, now again, I said, as I said, you can look in and make a decision. You can quantify it. And the first thing you have to quantify is what it looks like when you're done with the surgery. And just remember, the higher the points, the better it is. So if you have normal tubes and normal um, uh, and a, and a, uh, on both sides, um, and or if you have no fimbria, for example, uh, you know, then or um, an ovary which is completely diseased, then the the, the numerical score because you take the lowest one. So, for example, if you have a normal lens tube and a normal ovary, but no fimbria, it's a zero. So what happens is you get a zero, and you get a zero over here, and zero plus zero is zero. So therefore. When you take that score, you come down over here and uh, you will plot it on something. Now, so, but just to give you the principles, the principles are if at the end of the surgery, the tubes and ovaries are really completely uh, uh, not looking normal, then you know that your surgery, no matter how good you are, is not gonna come up with, with a spontaneous pregnancy. If the patient is under 35, or the years of infertility is less than three, a prior pregnancy, you see, you can get points so that you can come up with a score. Now in our patients, um, you know, if someone is 36, you have fewer points, more than three years is zero, and no previous pregnancy is zero, zero, and zero. So now you take this scores and you take, and you add up, this is called the historical and the surgical scores. If your, a, if your AFS score is 71, which it is in this patient on the upper one with obliteration of the cul-de-sac, and in fact, the lower one um, is not quite 71, but quite high. But if you look at the AFS scores, just the lesions, uh, you know, this one has obviously lesions here. Now, if you put this together, then you will come up with a score and you see the higher the score, the more the pregnancy rate. And this was reported um, so if you have a very high score over here uh, of nine to 10, you have a 69% pregnancy rate, non-ART over 36 months. So therefore the bottom one, this one here, definitely will have a high score because the tubes and ovaries are normal to start with. So you will have a high score and this patient will get pregnant. Instead, the one at the top, 
over here, no matter how good you are, if there's no fimbria and, and on either side, then your score will automatically drop because your surgical score is gonna be zero and your historical score will also be very low. And as you see here, the pregnancy rates are low. So this is how you use, this was published to a British journal, 5,000 patients almost validating the concept. But you can just use your eyes. If it looks bad at the end, it's not good. Now, what does this mean from a practical point of view? So this is publication uh, in 2020 by Horace Roman, who's a well-known endometriosis surgeon in Paris. What it is, is he took his patients that he did with colorectal endometriosis, and he allowed them, there were 36, either he allowed spontaneous pregnancy or sent them on to art, assisted reproduction. And so he looked at the end and said, this one here needs to go, it can get pregnant, this one here can't. And then he had patients that had to move on to, uh, to assisted reproduction or not. But really the middle part is uh, somewhat, Sorry, somewhat an, um, uh, just a, a follow-up. The most important thing is, if you look at spontaneous pregnancy or a combination of ART, we have a pregnancy rate which is similar. If you look at the life table analysis, again, they are uh, the, the natural conception is blue and the ART is the red line. And what you see is they're pretty, they're pretty similar. What it means, this is a non-randomized trial. What it means is at the end of the surgery, this highly skilled endometrial surgeon said, this person, I've done a good job, tubes and ovaries are fine. And they let them get pregnant and most of them did. And at the end you say, no, this didn't work. I'm sending him off to IVF. And that is the skill of looking at it or use the index. This was just published, um, uh, in, I think in this, this was published in 2020 uh, online, but I think it was published this year. This is a finished study and they had 925 patients of which they had the study group of 500, um, 543 patients that had deeply infiltrating disease. So, so they, they had a deeply infiltrating disease and either they had a, a, a rectal vaginal resection um, or bowel resection, or the operation was canceled, but we don't have to do that, look at that. So this is the way it distributed. So there were patients, they operated on immediately, and most of the time it was for pain. So they operated on for pain, and because the patient needed pain, and they did either a just a rectovaginal resection for deeply infiltrating disease, rectovaginal endometriosis, or they did a bowel resection, and then we have another group that he, they, they said, you know, the pain, pain is not that bad. Let us treat them conservatively, either with medical uh, management and then, um, uh, you know, uh, art or just spontaneous pregnancy. And what happens is they were not, and, and if you look, most of them did not get operated later and the ones that did operate later. But the point of it is that if you look at the pregnancy rate over the years, Conservative management versus operated. Conservative management, this is diff less than 40, and this is less than 40 as well. And this one here is rectal vaginal resection versus bowel resection. What it is, is again, the concept that if you treat a patient conservatively because they have no pain, with the medical management, you will achieve a pregnancy. But if you operate because they have pain, you will have a good pregnancy rate which, which mirrors that of spontaneous, uh, of uh, assisted reproduction or medical management. Now, if we go into a, a little bit more detail about the colorectal endometriosis and IVF outcome. So the untreated colorectal, so if you look at this uh, baluster, he, several publications, and you see that if you just look at untreated colorectal endometriosis and proven infertility, it, you do IVF, 68% uh, after a pregnancy after three cycles. But what is important here is the negative impact of adenomyosis, age, and antimalarian hormone. And this, uh, these three things come up all the time. So if you have a patient with adenomyosis and is older and a low antimalarian hormone, 
IVF will not work well. Maybe surgery won't work well, but IVF doesn't work all that well. If you look at this other <clears throat> one, this is, this is patients, um, again, untreated colorectal endometriosis. This instead is prior colorectal surgery. So again, median number of IVF cycles, comedor pregnancy rate, that lending that maybe prior rectal colorectal surgery can improve IVF, but then this is retrospective. This was published by the same group. What they did is a retrospective study and they looked at live birth rate, <clears throat> first IVF cycle and first line surgery followed by ART or just did ART. So if you look at that, if you operated and then did surgery, 32% versus 13%. Second cycle, 58 versus 24. And then by third cycle, 70 versus 54. So the, the live birth rates according to him were significantly higher for women who underwent first line surgery followed by ART compared with first line ART in the subset of women with good prognosis. So this is very important. It's only found surgery improved IVF outcome if there were young, had a high antimalarial hormone and adenomyosis. If they were young, had high AMH and no adenomyosis. Now this is a retrospective study. If they were over 35, had low antimalarial hormone adenomyosis, surgery in their study did not improve it. Now, and the other uh, modification here is that 17%, 44% of patients who had the immediate IVF group had a miscarriage rate, which is much higher than that. So retrospective study, Overall, not much improvement of IVF if you do um, the surgery beforehand. Now, Bianchi said, um, published this in JMEG, excision of deep endometriosis improves pregnancy rate. And the same thing goes over here. Um, deeply inflated endometriosis can improve pregnancy rate. But what is important here is the effect of adenomyosis. So therefore, we have another variable. Again, the three variables, age, antimalarial hormone, adenomyosis. So one of the things that's important here is, again, to, this, to talk to the patient. This was just published in uh, Fertility Sterility. And it's unique because this is not typical of, the, um, uh, of, of, of a typical study in Fertility Sterility. The fertility sterility is a quantitative, but this one here was qualitative, meaning that they talked to the patient. And if you see the conclusions in the treatment decision process for patients with deeply infiltrating disease, pain is always the most important decisive factor. The wish to conceive and strong fear of complications can change this choice. Doctors should understand the importance of fertility for the majority of women, but also if this is not considered paramount respect their view, meaning if the patient says I'm in severe pain, your IVF won't help their pain. You need to treat them. If you treat them, you have to be astute enough to know if this is going to improve their fertility or not. So the patient. Now, we have to also to take into consideration the complications from the surgery. And this was from uh, clermont Ferrand's group, well-known, Michel Kenis. And he, what he found was post-op complications developed in 13.9% of patients for deeply infiltrating disease. Some are minor, like infections, hematomas, but 4.6% developed a fistula, rectovaginal urethral fistula, bleeding and abscess. So again, this is very important because if you do bowel surgery, you may have a 9.3% complication rate. And this must be explained to the patient, you know, like, this is important, but just remember there are complications even in the best of hands. Now, if you look at this, this is the same group of Horace Roman who publishes a lot on this. And what they found, and this was published last year, so not too long ago, 4,000 patients, average surgery, average rate of surgery for recurrence, rate of, rate of surgery for recurrence was 15.3%. So there is a recurrent occurrence rate. And very importantly, if you are doing repeat surgery, it more, is then more than double the observed for first line surgery, which means that if someone is sent to me, which is usually my case, 
for repeat surgery, the complication is rate is higher. So they come to see me and they say, I want to have surgery. And, and I said, you've already had surgery. Complication rate may be higher. So in our case then, she's 36. Remember the endometriosis fertility index. If you have a patient who's 36, two year history, so less than three years, no prior pregnancy. Again, these are the historical ones. And if we look inside, and then we need to make an opinion, what's the priority, pain or infertility? Are, what's the age of the patient, over 35? Are, what's the span, uh, toner span? What does the tubal function look like? Are these normal tubes and ovaries? Then we have to consider the ovarian reserve. We have to consider the history of adenomyosis and tubal function if there are no fembria. So in our patient, then we have to consider whether we're going to do uh, one approach or the other. So then these are the references. And uh, for those that are interested um, in where I am working at this moment, um, this is London. This is Buckingham Palace right over here. This is the hospital, Cleveland Clinic London, that we are building. My office is in the building right next door, so I can see on, uh, across to the hospital or, or across to the Queen. And um, on that note, then um, I will conclude my talk. And I hope that has given you some insight into how we can do that. And I will I'll stop sharing my screen so you don't have to look at the uh, Buckingham Palace. Is that okay, Mohammed? <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot going on in Buckingham Palace. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's it. It's all Hollywood, all Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, okay? Yeah, thank okay. you so much. That okay. was great. Uh, we really appreciate uh, all what you shared with us, tons of data, and I'm sure that initiated a lot of questions. We have close to 300 people attending, actually, and still counting. Uh, so I would like to welcome Professor Omar Mamdouh Shaban, who is my co-moderator. He will be uh, moderating the question part to Dr. Falconi. Professor Omar. Professor Falconi, thank you for your, uh, we can say, magnificent lecture. Thank it's you. very informative and uh, very uh, clinical based, as well as you consider uh, the audience from the Middle East in your English practice, uh, that uh, how far you are exposed to the whole world. Uh, I have a lot of questions for you today, uh, and I have uh, stratify them in uh, categories. Uh, the first one uh, or the first category is about ovarian reserve. We have a question from Paul Young. Uh, can leaving asymptomatic endometrioma for a long time without surgery or hormonal suppression affect women ovarian reserve? You know, that's a very good question. And someone just posed this question to me and I forgot where, you know, like I was giving a lecture. That was they, me, Dr. Falcone. Oh, I was wondering. I said something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, I, and I'll tell you, the, the question is very important because I, I, I know for a fact that Mohammed has already designed the prospective clinical trial looking at this. Uh, because as soon as he posed the question and my answer was, in fact, there are no data to, uh, I can give you my opinion, uh, but there are, and there are no data for many reasons, you know, like the, uh, the tendency for most, um, especially large endometriosis. You see, the original trials for ovarian reserve that were published, where, we, where there's an intrinsic abnormality or not on, on, uh, on ovarian reserve as measured by antimalarian hormone, were in very small endometriomas, so less than three centimeters, you know? And so those ones, we, we, we tendency is to leave. But the larger ones, like four centimeters, five centimeters, we have tendency to remove them. So the, there are no real data uh, of, um, you know, that we can say. But I can only uh, give you my opinion. And my opinion is somewhat that, you see, the, the good news about ovaries is like kidneys. You know, like even if you mess up one, you have another, you know, your creatinine stays the same because you have another kidney. So, you know, and the same thing goes, the reason why we are lucky uh, that women have two ovaries is because even if our surgery doesn't really work well on one, then the antimalarian hormone or just ovarian reserve in general and pregnancy rates, in fact, can be taken over by the other side. That's why the bilateral ones are the ones. 
But if I had to uh, give my opinion, I would probably think uh, it is somewhat a progressive disease because it's an inflammatory disease. And if you don't do anything, now most patients actually go on um, birth control pills and therefore same. In fact, one of the slides, so I've you know, given this talk and, and, and there's a slide missing from it and it, it just dawned on me. So it's a good study that just came out this month in fertility sterility that, and the study shows and has to do somewhat with the question because I believe if you suppress, then you decrease inflammation. So in that study, and that study is from Paris with uh, Professor Ayubi, who's in Paris, uh, and he is one who did, uh, I know him because he did the uterus transplant and Dominique de Ziegler is, is there in Paris with him. And uh, they wrote an editorial, but it's based on a study. If you look at transferring euploid embryos into a woman with active endometriosis, the fertility rate is decreased, implantation is decreased. But what they did is they put everyone on suppressive therapy and transferred euploid embryos. So you know the euploid embryos, suppression you know, with estrogen and progesterone, that's all it is. And what they found was the pregnancy rate is the same. The conclusion is suppressive therapy alters the inflammatory environment to basically reverse whatever problem there was so that the pregnancy rates from transferring euploid embryos into a suppressed patient, which suppresses the endometriosis and therefore the inflammation will correct it. So to extrapolate from that, I can tell you that my opinion is that if the patient is suppressed, then I think long-term, you will not have a, a major effect on ovarian reserve. But if you don't suppress them, it probably does have a progressive effect, but that's just opinion. And then we will wait for what, one year, Dr. Badawi, before he <laughs> publishes his, his trial, he's already recruiting. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. Can I go to the next question? Um, uh, will you ever drain or fenestrate huge endometrioma, then IVF to avoid damage of the ovarian reserve? Or in other words, what are the limits that we can proceed to uh, surgery, uh, <laughs> to IVF without surgery? Right. So. If, if, if you can proceed to IVF without doing anything to the ovary, do it, okay? So if the patient has no pain, you know, like, uh, uh, now, but, you know, the, the uh, I don't, I personally don't believe, you know, like, that if the patient comes to me with a four centimeter endometrioma and I can get around the ovary, then I would just do it. But there comes a limit where you can't, you know, like, which is, um, you know, someone five, six, seven centimeter endometrioma, they're so big, they're getting in the way. So fenestrating, meaning basically draining the endometrioma, um, which you can do. And, and uh, I think it's not unreasonable, you know, to, to drain. Often they recur, but they may not be, and very quickly they recur, but the recurrence may be good enough, you know, like if you put the patient, if you drain it, put them on a, a, an agonist or some suppression immediately and then go to immediately to IVF, but don't wait. A long time because all you're doing is trying to get out of the way. Some people have now used sclerotherapy. I didn't talk about sclerotherapy, but you know, um, it's making a, uh, a, a comeback. Um, and uh, some people do it even without surgery. The ones I've seen is the, you know, with surgery. Uh, you can drain the cyst and then put in uh, a, a sclerotic agent, and that, and that would be good too if you're skilled at it. You know, there's a technique that was just published by Horace Roman, it's in, it's in the JMEG. Uh, so you can do that too. So the concept is not, you know, uh, eccentric, let's say, I think it's a reasonable one. If it's a big endometrioma, my first thing is to try to avoid it. But if you have to, I certainly would not try to remove it if you're gonna do IVF because you, you will decrease the ovarian reserve uh, for sure. Although again, like I said before, the good news is with two ovaries, if you remove one endometrioma, you can still have enough eggs and the patient will get pregnant. Thank you. Uh, moving to the surgical section, I have a lot of questions about the techniques and the uh, tips in surgery. The first uh, is, do you temporarily suppress 
the ovaries after lateral pelvic side wall dissection to decrease adhesions? Well, first of all, I, if, if someone doesn't want to get pregnant, so mm -hmm. if someone says, I want to get pregnant, I do the surgery and I say, go ahead, no suppression, you immediately. You know, I just said, you know, go ahead and get pregnant. You know, like, don't even wait. You know, as soon as you feel like it, do it. Okay, so that's the first thing. Um, if instead the patient says, I, I, you know, you did surgery for pain, I need suppress, I, 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 I'm not going to get pregnant right away, I'm going to wait a year. Then I definitely suppress. My choice of suppression, if they do not have uh, endometriomas, is just purely deeply infiltrating disease, I would offer the birth control pill for sure, and or the Mirena IUD, if they have no endometriomas. If they just, if they have endometriomas, the Mirena IUD will not prevent recurrence, and it's very high. So then you have to give the birth control pill. What I do not do is give a GnRH agonist. I, I use them, but I don't do that uh, immediately. I put them on the birth control pill or a progestin I don't know if in Egypt you have Dynogest, but in Canada they do. Uh, yeah. We don't have it in the United States, so we use norethindrone. But the best one is the birth control pill. They all go on it. And then I say, come off of it. If they can't tolerate that, then I give a progestin. Anyway, only, I only use the oral antagonists you know, the, uh, that are now becoming available if there's failure. But the most important concept is to suppress until they want to get pregnant. You know, like, absolutely, if the patient needs to be suppressed. Or if they want to get pregnant, they go right away. And on the other hand, you know, if the patient has surgery and at the end of the surgery, your tube ovarian system is not functional, meaning there's no fimbria, there's, you know, like the tubes uh, don't look normal, the ovaries, you know, you remove the endometrioma. Um, those are the ones where I would recommend, you know, to try to get pregnant immediately if, uh, rather than waiting because of that. And then it depends if they have adenomyosis on the MRI. So, Suppression for sure, all the time. Thank you. Uh, next question. Are there any safe limits for electrosurgery in Watts, uh, right. in both bipolar and monopolar? Right. So Someone would need to, you to more elaborate about that. Yes. So the, the you know, like the, the, the high voltage, you know, like uh, the higher the voltage, the, you know, like the more energy uh, that you, the more the spread of, of the disease, you know, like if you take high voltage and you just go near the skin, you see that. So I always use for all these surgeries, you know, like if you use bi uh, bipolar, you try to use the lowest wattage you can, you know, and usually it's at 30 because if you put it too low, but I'll tell you when I do, uh, when I do uh, 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 dermoids and I don't want a very deep penetration, because you know, you, as soon as you go too, too much energy, the thing will rupture. I use eight to 10 watts, very, very, yeah, very low on the surface. It's not meant to enter. I just use eight to 10 watts and then I take the scissors and I cut it and open it up. That's for doing. But the point of it is, is that you have to use like about 30 <clears throat> watts to uh, um, uh, as low as possible. For, the mo for monopolar, that's for bipolar. For monopolar, um, I use always pure cut. I don't use coag, you know, the coag one, you know, if they have that. Uh, but basically it's a, a you know, non-modulated current. So I use 20, but you know, the, the if you use micro bipolar, which is the one you can do, <clears throat> but you take a lot of time because you could be there for a long time. If I have to use extensive electrosurgery, I do, I do not. I either suture because, you know, again, the barb suture is easy, or use a hemostatic agent, put it there, do some other work, then go back, suck it out, take a look at what's there, and then use again uh, as low voltage. But you'll still, for bipolar, if you want to really get the vessels, you probably need um, about 30 watts. So, but again, the lower the, lower, the better, but you need the some, some energy. Thank you. Uh, again, in... Uh... Electrosurgery. There is a question about uh, your opinion about comparing electrosurgery with harmonic scalpel. Right. So harmonic scalpel. <clears throat> it's a it, it's a little bit different. You know, I, I use the harmonic uh, scalpel or, or mechanical energy uh, for fibroids. You know, because I don't want it to go deep. 
the the issue is you know for harmonic scalpel is that you you really need to know how to use it well you know like uh, to in order to um, uh, to to, uh, to get hemostasis so this is why you need to to really know how to use the harmonic scalpel well and so therefore you know when something is oozing and bleeding an, an ovarian depth it won't in my hands it doesn't work i need to do either electrosurgery or I use plasma energy or, or a hemostatic agent or suture. But plasma energy is something you can spray on like the J plasma or the, um, uh, you know, the, the J plasma is by Johnson & Johnson or plasma energy. So when you're doing harmonic scalpel, again, I do use it. I use it for a fibroids nucleation because I'm in sizing and then using the, um, the, the different modalities to uh, coagulate usually vessels as you go. Well, it's not as good if, you, if it's just bleeding, you know, like oozing from the entire uh, ovarian bed. So that's my experience. My experience then is to use uh, microbipolar plasma energy suturing or, or a hemostatic agent. Great. This leads us to uh, two questions about the pharmacological tamponade. Uh, yeah. One question we want you to elaborate more about the technique of vasopressin injection. Right. And uh, the other question is asking about the possibility of using adrenaline rather than vasopressin pressin if uh, vasopressin is not available. Right. Is vasopressin available in Egypt? Mm, to my knowledge, no. No. Okay. Mm. Too bad. <laughs> yeah. So if you if you happen to have vasopressin, uh, the the ones who use it is, are are people uh, the anesthetists use it. You know, anesthesiologists you know bring up the blood pressure. Anyway, vasopressin we use it a lot in fibroids. Do you use it in Canada, Mohammed? And, yes, we do. Yeah. Uh, actually, I have a small video clip about how to inject, but we can show that later. Yeah. yeah. So so the vasopressin. Is, is I diluted, I used to dilute it, you know, 20 units, because the vial is 20 units, um, in, in uh, 20 milliliters. And then they reported, uh, you know, cardiac arrest. So then I went to 20 units in 100. And then there was another publication of cardiac arrest. So then I went to 20 units in 200, and I have not read any uh, publications of cardiac arrest. So, but more importantly, we, I especially use it for fibroids, but, you know, for, cysts, ovarian cysts, is usually we need a lot of volume, you know, like so you can dissect the plane. So you put it in the injection needle and you put it in between the cyst and the, uh, and the uh, cortex and you inject it and it sort of lifts up. And it's only for this micro. Now for adrenaline, I have, first of all, I have no experience, so I can talk about it. But you know, the reality though is, is that it's, you don't, I'm, I'm not aware of studies where you dilute adrenaline. And the other thing is when they've used it in with xylocaine, xylocaine or adrenaline, which is what it comes with, in uh, for fibroids, it's, it has not been shown in the Cochrane review to decrease bleeding. So I will not give a recommendation for adrenaline. For vasopressin, it, do, it, it does work if you have it available, but I would dilute it 20 units in 200 so that you have, a, you have enough fluid you know, to really expand it. Yes, I have a single comment here from one of the audience that vasopressin is available in Egypt with okay. the name of glypressin by Faring. Okay, uh, let's move to, uh, sorry for having a lot of questions. Not what okay. about infected endometrioma? How am I going to manage? Right, so I have seen infected endometriomas. All of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes, unfortunately, caused by my surgery. But anyway, the uh, <laughs> so we I have seen infected hem uh, hem uh, endometriomas, and um, so you know there's post IVF, you know where you you have to be unfortunate, which is not, it's not common, and and also I've seen it spontaneously, and I've seen it post op, you know where I haven't drained it, and oftentimes it's confusing because some patients also have, you know, a lot of chronic pelvic inflammatory disease. You know, associated with the endometrium, so I never know if, which which one is which. Either way, I treat it conservatively, which is with antibiotics and CT guided drainage. 
So I don't, I try not to operate because it's a disaster. I mean, I've gone in there and it's, I can't find, I can barely find the pelvis. You know, the last, I remember once the anesthesiologist leaning over and says, where's the uterus? I said, I haven't found it yet. Give me another five minutes because it was so much, the bowel is stuck down. The place is full of, you know, uh, pus. So I, I do uh, IV antibiotics and I do CT guided drainage and leave the thing in until it's drained. And that's basically it. And then go on to IVF. So that's the way I treat it. If they don't respond, then you have to operate, obviously. Um, you know, you measure the, the usual way for sepsis. But my experience has been that they usually respond. Uh, and I have gone in and, uh, and the other thing is make, make sure you're not making a mistake because, which of course, you know, like the, uh, I, I know this only because I made the mistakes and therefore learned from them, which is I was treating, you know, which was uh, a sepsis from endometrioma, right-sided, acute appendicitis. It wasn't, it wasn't my uh, infected in, uh, endometrioma that was the start. It was the uh, appendicitis that I, and so I was, you know, treating it conservatively. And I said, I don't understand why this is better. And then of course, it turned out to be a acute appendicitis and we took it down. So I can only tell you, think of everything because, you know, I have seen, uh, I have seen it so all, but try not to operate. Try not to operate because it's a mess. You know, yeah. like it's, I can extend the question here from my side because we have encountered two cases uh, in our practice of uh, infected endometrioma after doing histocelpingography. Oh, trying yes, to me too. Uh, trying to evaluate the tubal patency in a patient yeah. with a primary endometrioma. Yeah. So are there any um, rules of, uh, or um, any uh, precautions of doing histocelpingography for patients with suspected deep endometriomas? Right. So depends, like if the way, you know, like we practice mess and me too, I always remember the worst case I've ever seen, you know? So I saw a patient like that. I did a hysteroscopy, the nice, it's always the nicest patients that, uh, that this happens to. She had bilateral endometriomas. I did a hysteroscopingogram, fulminant PID, hospitalized, drained, you name it. However, I have to tell you, the other 100 patients that I did hysterosalpingogram with endometriomas, everything, they were just fine. But I've always remembered that one. So it, I, my general rule is always the same. If the patient you know, has hydros, then I treat them with antibiotics. But I have not, I don't know what to say. You know, like the only thing I can tell you is that we do not um, do anything special. Patients with endometriomas are common. We do hysterosalpingograms. And then we decide, you know, how to manage them. So nothing special except that it does happen. Okay, let's move from the surgery to uh, medical aspects. I have one question here about dienogast and elagulex. Uh, and uh, what is the exact tool of uh, dienogast and elagulex? And I can add uh, levonorgestrel IOS to them uh, in patients with advanced endometriosis. Right. Uh, when I can use and when I should. Uh, well, I, I, you know, like, and I have many publications on. Actually, the one who published this is Mohammed here on uh, infertility sterility about medical management. But I'll answer the question anyway. Okay. <laughs> the uh, so the uh, in my opinion, um, the way to you know to proceed is always with some type of progestin for suppression, either the birth control pill or a progestin. And the proge or a selective progesterone modulated like nanogest. So I do not use, you know, the GnRH antagonists are moving in quickly. There's uh, Elagolix, you know, but there's the other one, uh, Rilagolix, which is being uh, approved, which is approved for fibroids and has ADVAC in it already for treatment of fibroids. So they're expensive drugs. And, and you know, like, and if you lose, if you know, don't have side effects, you probably don't have as much value to it because you're using the low dose. There's no side effects. They're still bleeding. They can get pregnant. If you use the high dose, it's like generate tagging. So it's not that there's not a role. So the, the, the principles for me are always the same. The patients that do not want to get pregnant. I suppress them forever, you know, like, but I use, because I have to suppress them for 25 years of their life, you have to use the drug that they can use for 25 years of their life. You know, like allergolics or GnRH antagonists or GH agonists, they cannot be used forever. 
So therefore, you have to use something whereby the patient will be using it for a long period of time. So, the, you know, like the birth control pill with the progestin or Dinogest, or I've used, uh, you know, norethindrone or et cetera. I do use, the, if, they, if they don't respond, I add allegolix and see if I can add to it, especially with, um, uh, and, and I intend to use the one that's approved for fibroids because it has add back and then switch them back as soon as possible. But all these drugs, the advanced drugs are all approved for a year, maybe two if you push it. Although people publish decades, but the reality is the patient needs to um, uh, have something which is long-term. So my suppressive therapy is, is that. I don't know if other opinions, but that's, that's the you know, most publications from, uh, from uh, all the experts that I've read. Great. Are there a place for more questions or, <laughs> you know, I have a lot. <laughs> so can we have three more questions? If, yes, uh, go if ahead. Time allow us. Uh, we have here a question about a uh, rule of GnRH agonist for three centimeter endometrioma before ECSI. Are there any rule of uh, down uh, regulation by GnRH agonists for these small endometriomas before proceeding to ECSI? I know it's a, a little bit outside our scope today. No, the, 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 so the, the original study for GnRH agonists um, you know, they said it was uh, valuable in improving pregnancy rates if you gave it for three months. And there was a Cochrane review on that too. My personal experience is that it didn't help. You know, in fact, when I put them on for three months, they never stimulated, you know, like I took up forever. And then they did a recent study which showed really a, there's no benefit. But there, the benefit is that I have had patients that simply have too much pain, but they don't want an operation. So I have put them on it and they do well, the pain is gone. And then I immediately go to IVF. Um, so you can, so I do use, I do not think that using agonists before IVF for patient that's asymptomatic, has a small fibroid, I treat them like the rest. If the patient has pain, then I will actually, you know, but no, they don't want an operation. Then I will use an agonist, suppress them, and then go on to IVF. In fact, I've used that regimen even, which has nothing to do with endometriosis. I've had patients with severe PCO with alopecia that if they're not suppressed, they lose hair. But if you put them on an agonist, they're so, so suppressed that their androgens are low and they don't lose their hair and they feel well and then moved on to IVF. So you have to be open-minded. You, know, you have to be, uh, you, you know, my, my approach is general principles, but I don't believe in long-term suppression before IVF is of value personally. Uh, because my experience is it takes like a, a gallon of, of gonadotropins to, to get the ovaries going. But if some patient, you know, have a lot of pain, I do move them from one to the other. Yeah, I have a question over if you don't mind. Uh, I have to advocate for my colleagues here from Vancouver because all of the questions are coming from Egypt so far. So, <laughs> Kony, you know these people quite, quite well. So, uh, Catherine Hilaire, I want to ask you this question. So, this Finnish uh, study seems to indicate that surgery for DIE and uh, fertility may not improve fertility outcomes. No, they However, didn't say that. Oh, they, they did say not that. say that. Okay. No, what did, yeah. what did they say? What, what they said what? was, mm -hmm. see, the problem with the Finnish study that just came out is they're self-selected by the surgeon, all right? Or even, you know, like they're self-selected not only by the surgeon, but by the patient. So if you look at the study, the Finnish study, the reason why they have superimposed similar pregnancy rates is because of the way we, we've learned to manage patients. Patients with a lot of pain and you operate, their pregnancy rate is as, if you look at it that way, is as good as those that didn't, did not have pain or minimal pain and were treated medically. So what happens is that they were treated, those other patients, they just were not treated with surgery. And that finished study basically says that if, the, if, you're, if you don't have to operate for pain and you use medical therapy, suppression, assisted reproductive technology, whatever it is that you throw at them is conventional because it's not, it's not a randomized trial or even a clinical trial. It's a observational cohort. And basically what they're doing is they're saying, if you operate on a patient, in fact, their pregnancy rate is good, as good as the ones you treated with medical therapy, 
or whatever therapy is. So it's not like you said you did nothing. Although I think there was a subgroup where they did nothing. But all these patients, they're very different. The point of it is, is that if I do my extensive surgery, even with bowel resection, I get a pretty good pregnancy rate. So I am advocating surgery under certain circumstances if the patient warrants it. So Catherine's uh, the rest of her comment is, uh, in Canada where surgery is insured, but IVF is not, should we be doing surgery for fertility without pain? And is it possible uh, that painful DIE, which are the ones uh, getting operated upon most of the time, has more impact on fertility, thus leading to some studies showing improved fertility? So there's, a, there's like three questions in there, but you know, let, me, let me tell you, first, in Ohio, where I'm from, they don't pay for IVF. But in Quebec, where I was originally from, they do pay for IVF. So, and in the province of Ontario, as far as I know, they also pay for IVF. So in British Columbia, you guys are disadvantaged. But you know, the reality is that in Canada, and if you're, it's the same in the United States, if you're from Massachusetts, you know, they'll pay for anything. They even pay for surrogacy, I think. You know, if you're from, um, you know, so it depends where you are, you know, where uh, Shady Grove is, where you do 6,000 cycles of IVF per year, it's also paid. So, so the first th question is, is the, um, it, it's a patient choice. Like, you know, like, uh, and, and patients all the time, you know, I still did do tubal surgery. Patient says, I, I, I'll never have IVF. So I do tubal surgery. You just have to choose. So th that's a question between, you know, the patient. The, the second thing is, that uh, the deeply in the concept of, of uh, patients, if it, though if we remove the, the cost, because like in Europe, they pay for IVF, you know, like if you're not treating pain, then IVF is the way, you know, you don't get, you know, I have seen every complication possible from, uh, from surgery, everything. I, don't, I can't think of one I didn't get. And those ones are hard to deal with, you know, like, uh, so therefore, the patient has to make a decision. And, uh, and so therefore, uh, I think that in, in a place like that, you know, it's ultimately the patient's decision, which is what the most recent paper showed. The patient has to make up her mind what she wants. The only thing is we know is art doesn't help pain. So if you're treating pain, and remember, I also think I'm not 100% sure that um, the endometriomas is the sole cause of pain. I think it's a deeply infiltrating disease. But, you know, like the, um, but again, I don't want to turn this into a, the surgeon's corner and the IVF corner, you know, because in fact, um, I think that they do overlap based on patient choice. Yeah, the, the second question from Vancouver is from Dr. Williams, Christina Williams. I think she's commenting about the endometriosis fertility index. So she is saying that uh, David Adamson, uh, coding that any endometrioma removal would get an ovarian score of maximally two. Do you ever give ovaries a three to four after endometrioma removal? I mean, in a good surgery. Well, remember it says it's a functional score. So that's Adamson's opinion. And in fact, you know, this has been revalidated like you know, many, many times. There are some things like no fimbria, we see the, the, the stuff in the middle is the hard part of all these scores. Like if you have no fimbria, <clears throat> that's a zero, we're done. You know, like yeah, it's as simple as that. So that's easy. Um, you know, if you remove three quarters of the ovary with your endometrioma or the ovary looks like a mess, that's a zero, we're done. But it's never gonna be that easy. It's gonna be a small endometrioma, you know, like I'm gonna say the ovary looks great at the end. So. You know, the endometriosis, but there, there is, there is, you know, uh, Jason Abbott did that study. There's some reproducibility, but the reproducibility is always in the extremes. Like if it looks great at the end, we all agree. And if it looks bad at the end, we all agree, but in the middle. So the endometriosis fertility index is, is somewhat of a, you know, it's a, quanti it's a quantitative thing, just like for ASRM score. Like after a while, I don't count, you know, I look at it and say, that's, that's bad. Like that's a four or like, you know, you go in and say that's a one or maybe a little bit of a two. So, you know, just to answer your question, the individual fertility index is to give us like everything, you know, <clears throat> S-ray, ASRM, AGL and ESGE have written a piece saying that they want to have a new endometriosis score. All right. So they're supposed to come it's being validated. Now they, the report, they want to publish it in JMEG. They want to publish it in fertility. Personally, I think it's a waste of time. 
Uh, it is true, it's not very predictive, but it's, it's good for communication. If I can tell you, this is a SRM score of four, uh, 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 stage four, you, you're gonna say, well, have it send her to me, I'll take care of her. If I say this patient has severe pain, operated on three times and has a stage one, you'll say, don't send her, <laughs> okay? So this is, it's all about communication. So the endometriosis fertility index, it's, you know, the concepts, you know, a woman who's older, infertility for a long time, you know, a, uh, um, no pregnancy, the, you know, like no fibria, you know, like ASRM score of uh, 71. I, I'm not, you know, like there's no miracle here. So this one here will go on, you know, but if you're doing the surgery for, for, for pain, go ahead. But at the end, you tell her, this is, you need to go on to the, uh, to art. So uh, just, just a very small comment here, Dr. Falcone. So we are operating less and less uh, given the data. So would you consider the sliding sign with dynamic ultrasonography, which is an indicator of how bad the endometriosis is, or at least complete cul-de-sac obliteration? Because to do an endometriosis fertility index, the classic way you have to operate. Yes. And there was a recent publication in, in, in your journal. Yes. <laughs> about using the endometriosis fertility and the, well, using the sliding sign to kind of infer what, how it look, looked uh, during surgery would be bad. So yeah, those yeah. patients wouldn't probably need to- I'm not, be, a, I'm not a fan yet. I mean, I, I would love to do it, but the reality is, you know, I've shown you some slides where the, um, the you know, the rectovaginal septum is fused completely. The uterus is fused. There's nothing moving. Tubes and ovaries are normal. That patient's going to do well and get pregnant. Correct. I'm not a fan yet. I mean, yes, and uh, and then in fact that they wanted me to uh, write a, um, a, uh, a, a a you know an opinion piece for the British Journal or Lancet or one of those journals, and you know like saying you know like the the utility of endometriosis for the index. Of course, ideally we we would love to um, you know to uh, to know beforehand, but you know it's not going to happen. So. That's for now, we have what we have. It, and that's why you let the patients decide, and especially if they have pain. Now we got to go back to Egypt, Mohammed. <laughs> yes, Omar, yours. <laughs> uh, okay, we exhaust you today. So uh, let's have a final question yes, to conclude yes. with. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we hope, to, we hope that uh, further questions we're going to cover, consider and going to cover in the next uh, uh, in the next webinars, yeah. Um, how we you you are talked about during your presentation about cross talks, yes, between the endometrioma and the uterus, right? So usually the rectal, yeah, uh, the endometriosis itself, yes, has an influence on the endometrium. See, I always thought it was only the other way, you know, like the, the endometrium caused the endo, but the endo has an effect on the endometrium. Uh, the question here is, are there any, um, we can say, evidence-based approaches that we can uh, perform during an IVF cycle to improve these crosstalks? Right. Suppression. You see, and that's the study that came out with using the uploid. What they did yeah. is they did the uploid embryos yeah. on a frozen thon cycle. And right. what they showed was that in a fresh cycle, they didn't have a good pregnancy rate. But in a frozen thought cycle, which is suppression of that lesion, gave you a pregnancy rate the same as everyone. And again, it's published in Fertility Strility, and it was, uh, the, the opinion piece was Dominique de Ziegler in Ayubi. And what they did was they basically said that if, if you're gonna do IVF on a patient with bad endometriosis, advanced endometriosis, that you should not do a, a, a fresh transfer because you need to suppress the pelvis before putting the embryos in. And that's how it showed. Uh, there's, a, there's been animal data for a long time, by the way, about that crosstalk. The original one, by, it was by someone named Facilabas. And he published it in the uh, non-human primate. I actually didn't believe it myself, you know, I said, you know until uh, I reviewed his grant. I was at the NIH at the time. Very smart, you know, like, and, uh, and changed my view of the world of how a retroperitoneal cul-de-sac lesion, I used to say, look, the tubes and ovaries are normal. They have a retroperitoneal lesion. How can this cause infertility? And I was thinking as a surgeon rather than a basic scientist, which is that it can have an effect, 
but not by you know, directly uh, implanting it. So suppression is the answer. Do not, uh, when you do IVF, freeze everything, transfer. And on that note, Thank as you. Say, as they say in Italy, buonasera. <laughs> <laughs>